Good morning and aloha. Good morning and aloha. Please be seated, and those in the back, if there are any remaining seats, please move forward and find one. Text any questions you would like to direct to the panel to the address shown on the screen, and as a courtesy to our panel members, we also ask that you silence all communication devices at this time. I'd like to welcome you to the US Indo PACOM J6 panel titled MAGIC, MPE, Assured C2, JAD C2, Enabling Security and Interoperability with Coalition Partners. On the panel this morning, we have our moderator, Brigadier General Paul Friedenberg, U.S. Army retired, Executive Vice President, Defense and National Security, AFSIA International. All panel member bios are available in the AFSIA 365 app under today's panel events. Sir? Thank you very much. Hey, it's really great to be uh, back in Hawaii. Uh, I love it. We lived here for some time, and it is great to see a lot of familiar faces out here and very good to meet some new uh, folks out here today. So welcome to this morning's uh, panel session. And we have our topic today is magic. So each one of these individuals has a favorite magic trick that they're going to perform for you live in front of this audience today. Smoke, mirrors, card tricks, we have them all up here today. So uh, just stand by and get ready. Uh, so, no, uh, seriously, this is uh, magic. If you break it out, mission partner environment, assured C2, JAD C2, joint all domain command and control, enabling security and interoperability with coalition partners. This is a critical, uh, all of these efforts together are critical to achieve that decision dominance and operate with our allies and partners, and it underpins uh, as you heard uh, um, uh, Admiral Paparo uh, speak yesterday, uh, the operations for uh, PAC fleet, you heard th this morning uh, the, the Marines talking about their stand-in uh, forces uh, and capabilities that are required to enable that construct. Uh, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. And we have the right group of leaders uh, here uh, in the Indo-Pacific to talk about these topics here today. So let me just take a, a couple of minutes and, and introduce uh, each member. And, and as soon as I introduce you, I'll give you a couple of minutes just to provide any opening uh, comments that you would uh, have. So Brigadier General Denise Brown, uh, U.S. Indo-PACOM Director J J6. Uh, she received her commission in the United States Army from Georgia Southern University. Uh, and then prior to joining Indo-PACOM, Brigadier General Br Brown served as the Department of the Army as the Executive Officer and the Plans and Strategy Division Chief within the CIO G6. And prior to that, she commanded a Defense Information Systems Agency in Europe Field Command uh, supporting UCOM. Uh, but she does have some experience here uh, on the island in Hawaii. She commanded the 307th Integrated uh, Theater Signal Battalion uh, right here uh, on Oahu. Uh, and deployed that to uh, Afghanistan. So she's well qualified uh, to talk about uh, these critical enablers that we have here today. But go ahead. Okay. Hey, uh, good morning and aloha. First of all, um, I appreciate General Skinner's comments. Uh, lesson learned, don't joke with him prior to his uh, <laughs> opening comments. Uh, but I do want to uh, highlight one thing and uh, magic, as we call it. Uh, it's a team sport. And so we have these components uh, represented here today, and they each play an absolute critical role, and none of us would be successful uh, without them. I'm not gonna take up much time, because I know you have uh, introductions and some questions, so. Absolutely, all right, so next uh, up we have uh, Mr. Bob Stevenson, who serves as the Director for Communications and Information Systems and Chief Information Officer for, and the commander, for the Commander of U.S. Pacific Fleet. Uh, he's a graduate of the United States Naval Academy and after a successful military career was appointed to the Senior Executive Service in April 2018. His career experience includes significant roles in all aspects of engineering and acquisition. He's previously served as a technical director for fleet readiness, space, and naval warfare system at the Naval Warfare Systems Command, uh, and he has led the fleet systems engineer 
uh, and the U.S. Navy technical warrant holder for C4I and coalition and interoperability. And so, uh, Bob, uh, over to you, my friend. Uh, thanks, Paul. And it's, uh, it's great to be here today. Um, and I want to emphasize what Denise says. This, this is a team sport. Uh, some of our teammates aren't here, and that's our coalition partners, and of course our partners in industry, you guys are here, as well as our par partners in academia, and it's going to take all of us. Um, this is a maritime fight, but it is a joint fight. And it, it has to be won in all domains. We, we must prevail in space and cyber. If, if I don't convey to you today our sense of urgency, if you did not listen to what my boss said yesterday, um, we, then I've failed to do my job, and I look forward to answering your questions today. And it's, it's not magic, it's physics. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, uh, Bob, and it's great, great to see you again. Uh, Colonel Lisa Whitaker is the Deputy Chief of Staff, G6, for the United States Army Pacific Command. Uh, she received her commission from the United States Military Academy at West Point. Uh, and prior to the assignment here, she commanded the Defense Information Systems Agency Global Field Command headquartered at Scott Air Force Base. I'm starting to see a trend here. I think uh, DISA and uh, General, General Skinner might be taking over the, taking over the world here. Uh, <clears throat> she, uh, Colonel Ritika has also served in various leadership positions, ranging from platoon leader to brigade commander. She has tactical and strategic experience and deployed to Operation Enduring Freedom as Deputy G6 for the mighty Screaming Eagles, 101st Airborne Division, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And she has experience out here in the Pacific from the 78th Signal Battalion uh, Commander, which is headquartered out in Japan. So, Lisa, it's great to see you again, uh, and uh, over to you. Uh, good morning and aloha, sir. Thank you for the introduction. So I really look forward to uh, speaking to the audience about the great things going on in USAPAC and certainly going on in, in the Indo-PACOM theater. Uh, we certainly enjoy being a part of the J6 team out here. I think we're doing great things and there's many opportunities, as you'll see, for us to accomplish the Army level initiatives, joint initiatives as well. And I look forward to discussing how USAPAC is approaching uh, the magic uh, concept and the things that we're doing to p propel the initiatives. So thank you. Thank you. And next we have Colonel uh, Donald Cloud. He's the Deputy Director of Air and Cyberspace Operations for Headquarters Pacific Air Forces. He's a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy, and his previous assignments include a variety of operations and staff and joint tours in airspace, cyberspace, intelligence, and nuclear deterrence operations. His command assignments include serving as a vice commander for the 67th Cyberspace Wing and commander of the 375th Communications Squadron. His special duty assignments include having served as special advisor to the Vice President of the United States and special assistant to the NATO Supreme Allied Commander for Transformation. So, Donald, Cloud. Good morning and aloha. Thunder. Thunder. It's, a, it's great to be here. Um, uh, I will, I will uh, share the uh, sentiment that uh, we need your help, that cyber is a team sport. Uh, looking forward to partnering with you as well as our allies and partners and our, and our uh, service brothers and sisters on our left and right flanks. Um, uh, I will share just for the purposes of some of the maybe dropping some hints on some questions uh, to some of the things the Air Force is trying to do. Uh, transform our AOCs to a data-centric AOC. Transform our kill chain into a data-centric JADC2, true JADC2 kill chain. Uh, transform our legacy networks that we think of classically. Uh, for those of you who love or hate the AFNET, uh, I want to kill it and replace it with something that's relevant at times. We call that the Integrated Warfighting Network, and we're doing some pilots out here uh, to try to bring in modern technology and have you help us figure out what that future looks like. Um, data at the tactical edge, so we can do agile combat employment in a deployed environment spread across uh, the entire Pacific so that we can deter and defeat China and then mission defense teams for mission assurance because China poses a huge uh, cyber threat to our mission capabilities, C2, 5th gen, uh, as well as uh, critical logistics. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that uh, uh, the Air Force tends to be impatient. We tend to be the youngest and most impatient service, but uh, the, the clock is ticking in regards to uh, being able to transform our enterprise, be more combat capable and fight. So looking forward to the discussion and the questions. Thank you. And uh, the last member of our panel today is Colonel uh, Koichi Tagag Tagagi, I'm sorry, uh, currently serves as the Assistant Chief of Staff of Information Environment Division at the U.S. Marine Corps Forces Pacific. 
Uh, he enlisted in the Marine Corps and served through the rank of Staff Sergeant before being commissioned. Uh, and he's graduated from the University of Arizona with a Bachelor of Science degree and is well decorated uh, in his educational experience. And it would take me quite a long time uh, to read all of your um, academic achievements, but very, very uh, impressive. <laughs> he has extensive experience in the Pacific region uh, with service in Hawaii and Okinawa. He commanded the Marine Wing Communication Squadron 38 in San Diego and was the Assistant Chief of Staff for Communications and Information Systems for the Marine Corps Installation West. With a little different perspective, as a Director of the Operations in the Information Environment, I own both the traditional G6 Assured C2 and Knowledge Management, uh, and as a Communications Officer by background, uh, that's where my, I'm most comfortable, but I also am responsible for deception, operation security, electromagnetic spectrum operations, space, cyber, influence operations across the information environment. Um, I'm responsible for ensuring that our forces have the right information at the right time while denying that cognitive space to our adversaries. So a, uh, a new perspective that we have here at MAR4PAC, established by uh, General Berger when he was here at MAR4PAC, and uh, something I think is important, some additional considerations beyond traditional C2. All right, great, thank you. Uh, and then if I could just remind everyone, uh, I think it's up on the screen, but questions, please text them uh, to the questions. I do have a few I want to start off with, uh, opening salvo, if you will. But I, I know everybody's uh, interested here in how they can uh, support or, or what, what, the, what, so I'd like you to, each of you, and we'll just go uh, straight down the line. What, what is your current focus? What, what, is, what is your, you know, immediate efforts as we look at uh, improving the mission, par mission partner environment in support of U.S. Indo-PACOM. And I think it's appropriate we start with you, Denise. Okay, sure, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna start off with kind of providing a little bit of background. You've heard Admiral Paparo speak. Uh, we heard uh, the DCOM for MAR4PAC uh, speak earlier. Uh, and if you haven't heard uh, or didn't read Admiral Aquilino's testimony is that uh, Indo, uh, Indo-PACOM is the most uh, consequential theater right now. We have four of the five uh, identified security threats. How we're getting after this is through uh, his approach is called Seize the Initiative, and that's towards achieving integrated deterrence, and where that fails, you know, being able to prevail in conflict. Uh, so I, I give you, I lay that as the foundation because you'll also, uh, if you didn't hear, hear in his testimony that he has charged the joint force to think, act, and operate differently. And so uh, when he took command shortly in, after, in April uh, last year, he charged all of his commanders and his staff to do exactly that. But he expanded on it. It's not just about think, act, and operate differently. But when he says that is, let's look at how the existing systems and the existing capabilities we have today how do we use them differently? How do we make them work better now instead of waiting for capabilities to be delivered in 2030? Uh, we've actually modified it. Really, it's about posturing for the future. And so that's what we've done with the mission partner environment. Uh, there's a, a couple of key uh, elements that we're working. One, we had to increase resiliency of our current uh, coalition networks, and we're doing that through uh, redundancy and enhanced cybersecurity. But then we also had to uh, look at how we were sharing mission data with our allies and partners, because at the end of the day, that's how we're going to compete, that's how we're going to react to crisis, and that's how we're going to um, fight alongside uh, each other in conflict. Uh, so what we've had, what we've started developing, and I think you heard uh, General Skinner mention it briefly, is we have a, a mission data platform. It is a data-centric approach. It's a hybrid cloud environment and it allows us to securely integrate operations and intelligence data uh, at a secret releasable level. Uh, and so it is, uh, it, it's also allowing us to collaborate. It is, um, we are using the existing networks and we've really superimposed this data-centric approach over our existing networks to where we didn't have to go back and rebuild networks while we are, uh, again, just waiting to posture for that future. I think most people know what MPCO efforts are and so while we await that 
uh, we are now able to securely share um, our blue and our red picture. And you know, we're using the existing authoritative data sources. So when I look at industry, uh, one lesson that we've had here and when we you know, continue on with this data-centric approach is um, it's not about uh, having to have one set data standard. It's about how do we integrate the, sta uh, the data. It's how do we use APIs. APIs are absolutely the, um, the future for us to be able to integrate our data from these different systems. And I think for our, our industry partners to be able to integrate these tools uh, that mu mu many of us are using, uh, and they're not always the same tools. So uh, I will stop there, and I'll pass it on to Thunder. Thunder, thunder. Oh, okay. I was getting ready to sing a little bit ACDC. There's a there. song. <laughs> yeah. That the dancing comes later, ma'am. Yeah. The uh, um, uh, I'll ping you back with regards to some of the uh, efforts that we have going on uh, at both Pacific Air Forces as well as the U.S. Air Force writ large. I hinted at some of them uh, before. Um, I, I will say General Wilsbach has charged us to prepare PACAF as part of the Joint and Combined Force. Uh, by 2026 to set the theater with the capabilities we need. So the clock, when I say the clock's ticking, we've set a deadline for ourselves and being able to try to do a lot of work. Um, uh, a couple of the, if you call it the priority efforts, we have to have data-centric C2. Uh, think of our classic air operation center. For us, it's a joint air operation center. Uh, that's to, there to provide joint uh, air superiority as well as uh, enable joint strike. Uh, in support of, uh, of, of everything we're doing in competition as well as uh, potentially if called to, uh, you know, to, de uh, to defeat. Um, uh, coming soon, we're gonna start rolling out uh, what's called Kessel Run, for those of you who are familiar with that, uh, out in this theater for the Pacific AOC. Um, I wish it had come a lot faster, but uh, you know, uh, uh, this summer we'll start fielding some of those capabilities, uh, looking to try to accelerate uh, getting those capabilities online much faster. So that's kind of part one. In, by the way, being baked in by the Air Force is a uh, MPE capability. So it's gonna be, it's gonna come MPE native. They still got a lot of work to do, but we need to make sure uh, things are interoperable so we can connect. So I'd say that's probably one of the things we could probably have industry help with. Open standards that allow these things to connect easily and readily. Um, so that uh, as we all are building different uh, platforms, if you will, uh, if we establish a governance, we can hook them up and anybody can, can become a feeder or a consumer, um, and then we can increase the speed of our operations. Um, kill chain, everyone's heard about ABMS. Uh, a lot of it's about adding automation so we can shorten the time of the kill chain. Uh, we're looking to try to cut the, 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 the length of our kill chain and our most difficult problem sets, which will be uh, uh, closer into our potential peer adversaries uh, to try to cut that time in half. So we could use industry help with regards to automation to eliminate the humans in the loop for the entire kill chain. And that's the joint kill chain, so not just the Air Force piece of it. Uh, we could use some help along there. Um, and that's also bringing in our uh, uh, coalition partners to be able to do that. Integrated warfighting network, uh, uh, industry's actually helping us with this. A lot of the capabilities are out there in industry um, that for software defined networks that allow us to kind of really re-engineer everything we have so we can have something flexible, survivable, for assured C2. Um, and most importantly, we can extend it to the tactical edge uh, so that as we disperse our forces and they're operating separately, they could still have uh, unity of effort, unity of command, uh, and, and mass fires. Um, so we have some uh, Edge Connect uh, MVP pilot programs, cloud native access points, software defined networks. There's a lot of work going on in that arena because we're trying to help the Air Force figure out if we can do it here, we can do it anywhere, and we can help the Air Force fix that. Last but not uh, least is uh, we can probably use some help on uh, solutions at scale with regards to mission defense teams uh, and our ability to, to scope and scale mission defense. Uh, uh, it's, it's not smart to be able to have thousands of mission defense teams spread everywhere, trying to do point defenses everywhere. That is not combat capable. Um, so we can, we're can we looking for innovative ideas of how to do that scope and scale. So think, how do we defend C2 nodes? How do we defend fifth gen mission capability? How do we defend uh, critical logistics so that we can project power and fight? So think fuels, logistics, critical infrastructure. So I will stop there. Those are our big priority efforts in PACAF. Well, thanks. You know, Thunder, Thunder, Told you what our timing and tempo is. This is a this is a right now problem. Um, I would say my my primary focus area uh, is right now is is transport and and basically being able to use the revolution in transport that's happening. Mm -hmm. I think if you've heard of, you've heard about Starlink, there are about two thousand satellites on orbit right now. We have sent Starlink at sea. Uh, USS Paul Hamilton was the first ship. USS Chafee is next. 
There's a terminal being flown aboard USS Abraham Lincoln today. Uh, actually, in a, uh, we're going to do two orbital regimes with Lincoln, both LEO and MEO. Uh, we've done MEO trials with uh, all of our uh, deploying carriers since Nimitz. Uh, we've seen amazing effects. I mean, not only in, in our, our, our combat power and our ability to sustain forces at sea, but also in, in, in what it takes us to help the people that are embarked on those ships. You know, we have deployed throughout COVID. The deployments have been lengthy. They've been preceded by a 30-day sequestration. So imagine young Americans going to sea and being away from their families for a year. No port visits, no nothing, staying at sea. Um, we did, you know, and as for the ships that we've enabled with this, uh, this uh, MEO capability, they've all come back and said, best cruise ever. How can that be? Well, I could talk to my family all the time. Uh, I can I can do all my training. I can stay current in my college courses. If I got hurt, my doc the doctors on board could do telemedicine. All enabled by this technology, which takes away the latency and bandwidth limitations that it, which have plagued us for the last 20 years. It is truly the rising tide that floats all boats. We're trying to share that with the joint force. There are classified capabilities that come with it that are is equally compelling. Uh, but we're making that our centerpiece of our resilient command and control, if you th and, and the key lies in the proliferated number of satellites. Uh, I recently played in a, a war game with, uh, with uh, Koichi. Uh, I think we, uh, we, we fought in space. I think I had about a 9,000 to 1 advantage at the end of the game. That's the physics part that makes it hard to overcome. Industry is going so fast, we've got to keep up. This is, this is as revolutionary as what happened what happened in the, in the 90s when we first put networking on ships. But it's going to change the entire joint and coalition force, both in its survivability, its capability, its lower cost. Uh, you know, we're, we're paying, uh, I think I'm, I'm paying $55,000 a year for, the, for Starlink service. That includes, the, that includes the cost of the terminal and the cost of the service. 200 megabits a second, about 0.8 milliseconds, or 80 milliseconds latency. All you technical guys in, in the room know that it's there. The second transport revolution is 5G. We're part of a 5G pilot sponsored by OSD. We've got two things we're working on. The first one is the first one is 5G technology to improve aircraft readiness. As you know, Secretary Mattis, uh, during his term, looked at the military readiness rates of our aircraft, and it was abysmal. Um, the Navy brought in commercial industry to look at our best practices. Uh, they went from about 200 and something ready jets a year to over, you know, a constant rate of about 380 and they're going higher. They're doing the same things with our C2 aircraft, the E2s. Uh, the pilot came along just as, just as the commercial guy said, you know, you guys have done all you can do with process. The next big barrier you have to overcome is your IT is basically legacy and it doesn't meet the needs. So we're doing that. We're doing edge computing enabled by 5G. We're doing it at two bases. First one here is at Joint Base Pearl Harbor. We're working on all services aircraft helicopters, C-17s, F-22s, P-8s. We're also going to uh, Naval Air Station Woodby Island. Uh, Naval Air, that air station is the home to our uh, electronic attack aircraft, the, e the EF-18. It's the only dedicated EA aircraft used by all the services, not just us. Uh, that's very important to us. We're going we're to improve their maintenance, and that's also the home station for the P-8s. We've got two different approaches we're looking at. Uh, I've already seen the, the first uh, the technology demonstrated. It's very exciting. It's built with cybersecurity from the control plane up to the data. Very exciting. Enabled by artificial intelligence. I think it's going to be a breakthrough. The second pilot is going to connect, is to take that service, which is think of a metropolitan area network, and connect it to a LEO satellite. So think about a telecom in a box. And what Equilino talks about places, not bases. Where we're going to operate, we're going to need to bring the IT to them into places where it's not there. We're going to demonstrate that this, you know, in the, in the next year, starting at uh, Nav Mag Lua Lua Lay, which is an important base. Uh, we're also going to put them on aircraft carriers. Uh, we're going to put one on George H.W. Bush in the Atlantic and one on um, a ship to be named out here, probably, I, I lost the name, I think it's Vincent. Anyway. Revolution in transport is the key to, to uh, resilience. Resilience in C2 is based on mass and maneuver. Proliferated networks give us, give us the mass. Uh, smart people in technology gives us the maneuver. 
much like cloud and the others, I'm looking for uh, clouds. We're already we're all, already investing in cloud computing in our mock. Seventh Fleet's been running on one. Uh, our our new mock, when it is built, will run on one. But these are these are clouds which have to be able to operate if they're disconnected from the hyperscale cloud. My speech to industry is bring us that. We need that. We'll talk more later, but it's an exciting time. We have a big sense of urgency. We're trying to go fast. Uh, we're trying to bring every. We're trying to bring the entire force with us. Over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, good morning. There's two two key topics that Mar4 Pack uh, Information Environment is looking at right now. The first is is integration, and the second is kinetic non kinetic fires integration. Uh, kinetic non kinetic fires integration. With integration, we're looking at naval, joint, coalition, and interagency. And the extent to which we are truly integrated or simply interoperable or maybe just co-located, right? Because that's a different level of, uh, of working together. And we're looking at whether that Marine or the warfighter that we're supporting anywhere in the joint force has access to the right data. And so a Marine may be working on a base at Camp Pendleton or in Kaneohe. They may be aboard ship. Uh, with a different credential, a different identity, different access to data. They may move from the ship ashore as a part of a joint or a coalition force, and yet again lose access to previous important data and not understand the new data streams and inter, inter, uh, information exchange requirements they have in this new structure. And they may be passing information. A Marine may be a sensor from a radar or a visual uh, capability at, at on ground. They may be a airborne sensor. They may be a processor uh, or an analyst um, uh, or a decision maker in the sense, makes sense, an act paradigm. And then Marines love to be at the act. We love to be that, that kinetic weapon system. We may be long range fires. We may be an aviation platform. We may be a shooter. In all those pieces, do we understand, are we dealing with enterprise level data? Are we dealing with commercial cloud? Is it tactical links, data, voice, uh, link 16, message formats? Is that individual going to have access to data in all those different environments? And is it going to be the same data? Do we need to retrain an individual in all these different environments as a member of a joint interagency coalition or naval fight? I'm looking at that in, in kind of three paradigms. One is policy. Some policies, we're, we're dealing with policies from the 90s, which is uh, you know ages ago in information exchange. There may be policy barriers. Often there's technology barriers where we simply can't do it. Policy is we shouldn't do it, technology is we can't do it. Procedural barriers are things we can do and are allowed to do, but we're not doing, right? And so policy, technology, and procedure are standing in the way of even our naval integration, never mind the joint coalition and interagency. So we're trying to smooth that out the best. Um, and again, I think about this when, when we talk about integrated, and my challenge for anyone de designing a system that works in any of these environments is, is it truly integrated where an individual is working and they see the data they're used to and they see the new data that you're giving them and it all makes sense? Or is it, is it interoperable, meaning, well, from here, I can go through some hoops and get back to my old stuff, but it's, I'm interoperable, but I'm not really integrated. Or am I just coalition, or am I, am I just co-located? We have individuals that read something on one screen and type it in to an entirely different system, all right? And that's not an integrated system. That's a, that's a co-located system at best. The second topic, kinetic and non-kinetic fires. We cannot plan and execute space, cyber, cognitive effects in the absence or separately of kinetic effects. And we can't blur those and saying, well, because non-kinetic is not non-lethal, not equivalent, and kinetic is not lethal as equivalent. There's a lot of interplay between all these. We may be driving, we may use cognitive effects to drive an adversary towards a kinetic result we're looking for, or vice versa. And so how within our command uh, information environment largely uh, overseeing non-kinetic effects is tightly integrated with our kinetic planning, which is um, you know, a long-standing Marine Corps uh, core function. So that level of Naval Joint Coalition Interagency integration and our integration between kinetic and non-kinetic effects are what I'm focusing on.
Thank you. And Lisa. Yes, sir. So uh, here in USAPAC, we, we actually have a plan, and we've been focusing on the uh, C2 expansion, and from that perspective, it kind of provides the foundation as we move forward. And so what we've been doing is actually uh, expanding the network uh, west of the international dateline, and that provides the transport required for us to be able to be able to do and execute the things that we're looking at. So at the end of the day, uh, we're providing dozen points of presence um, in approximately nine countries uh, west of the international dateline, which will provide the access that we need in order to uh, execute so that we, our focus is to see ourselves. And once we can see ourselves, then we can think and act and operate differently. Um, that expansion provides a foundation. We're incorporating it through Indopaycom into MPE, so that provides greater access. We've installed um, gate routers, um, more importantly, in the, at the DISA location. So now we have the opportunity to expand MPE through tactical assets as well. Um, so as we move forward, we're, we're actually continue to work as we flatten the network. Our focus is on having this, the Pacific instantiation of a unified network, knowing that once we flatten the network, we have another security concern that we need to address as well. So we're doing this systematically such that we're able to provide seamless uh, ability for units to ingress and egress the theater and to communicate uh, seamlessly so that we can actually provide the maneuvers and fires that we need uh, to execute. Um, so at the end of the day, um, it's a systematic approach. We have a program in place where um, we're approaching it from a strategic perspective where we're going to iteratively um, test and experiment in theater using our pathways um, as the environment to do that in so that in actuality the users that are going to be operating in that framework can give us feedback um, and we're going to continue through that uh, until uh, for the first two years and we're using Talisman Saber as our um, pinnacle requirement experiment to determine where do we go from here. Uh, where our intent is to operationalize the network. Uh, we have a PET center that's actually being installed here in, in Honolulu, and our intent, again, operationalized data as well. So it's a, it's a really, uh, I think, um, logical and objective approach to the problem set, but I think that we'll be able to uh, quickly achieve some outcomes and then move forward and know how to more um, frame our perspective as we move forward to, um, to execute multi-domain operations in theater, which is really our intent. Yeah, thank you, uh, team. That that is uh, great. And as you can see, uh, talking about uh, MPE and the question, but it is hard. Uh, you cannot separate that from all the other, um, you know, JADC2 elements, pieces, and parts because it's it's integrated. It's it's got to come out uh, as an enabling uh, all of those capabilities, specifically our uh, mission partner environment, due to the importance of our allies and partners. But Denise, I want to give you a, a an opportunity. Because uh, I know you are just focused on your, your MP, and there's a lot more that, that goes into this, but if you could give us just a kind of top-level view of some of the other major priorities that you have out here in Indo-PC. Yeah, so uh, for the J6, our top three priorities are MPE, which I already spoke about, and before I forget to mention, MPE is Admiral Aquilino's number two priority for Pacific deterrence initiatives. And anybody that's been a six knows that now makes your, your number one. Uh, if it's your boss's number two, three, four, whatever it happens to be. Um, and then Assured C2. And the team here just talked a lot about the efforts of Assured C2. And so I talked earlier about how, you know, what we do in this theater is a team sport. Well, Assured C2 absolutely is. Um, what Bob is doing with Starlink and the transport uh, with 5G, what, uh, PACAF is doing as well as uh, USERPAC and MAR4PAC and, you know, USERPAC extending the terrestrial circuits. Um, this, it, when we go, when we look at this theater and our ability to um, assure C2 to be able to in, enable, you know, the JAD C2, because we already, we already operate in a joint all domain. Uh, every operation, every exercise, experimentation, the COM and the component commanders are focusing on it from a joint all domain. You heard that from Admiral uh, Paparo. Uh, so we continue to focus on that. Uh, the last thing I, I would add is, you know, how do we modernize the U.S. Indo-PACOM headquarters as a war fighting command? Uh, you know, coming from the CENTCOM theater, it's a very different uh, headquarters and headquarters network compared to what you have in, um, in Indo-PACOM. So 
General Skinner also teed up, he spoke about uh, multi-domain delivery, and so part of what we're trying to do is move to a full-on BDI environment. One, it helps us with our endpoint security, uh, and it gets all of our, it gets everything on a single pane of glass, um, zipper, nipper, and coalition. And you know, where we learn from each other, uh, we were actually able to use a, uh, a similar approach that Bob Stevenson used for his uh, adaptive force package there at Seventh Fleet. Did I have that right? Um, excellent lessons learned. Uh, and so I, I just pull that thread to be able to reiterate the theme of how much we learn from each other and are able to um, adapt. You know, General Lawrence, we were talking about earlier, plagiarism's best form of flattery. I'm all on board with that. N did not happen at Georgia Southern, but I am on board <laughs> with it uh, here as the J6. So uh, thank you, Paul, for letting me go back to that. Thank you. I know we have, uh, we actually have some questions from the audience. I have one question that I'd like to uh, turn over to the, to the service uh, teammates here uh, about, um, you know, uh, some people have said we've been struggling with this kind of joint, uh, all the main, you know, decision dominance, uh, you know, getting those common operational pictures, sense, understand, decide for, for a long time. Uh, but I would argue that there's there for quite a while the technology didn't didn't wasn't quite mature yet. Now f some individuals are saying that the technology is mature in the commercial sector, but we're slow to adopt it and, and integrate it into uh, our operations. And so uh, from a, from the service perspective, and again I'll just go uh, straight down the line starting with you, Thunder. But what do we need to do uh, to accelerate? Uh, and integrate these emerging uh, capabilities uh, in, into the war fighting force? What are some things that we, we could do to improve and speed that up? Um, I'll offer two things. Uh, one is being open to the experimentation so we can partner as industry to go fast, to prove a concept out, and that way we can help in this case, since funding comes through our service change mostly, uh, we can scope and scale a capability. So that's, that's one of the approaches we work. So uh, stop trying to tilt at the windmill and try to help steer the windmill the right way. Um, probably the second thing um, is actually probably trying to better uh, better partner with industry to understand what's actually out there. There's a lot of capabilities that are out there that uh, I, I know I don't know about um, that could probably help us with all these operational problems. So that's just constant dialogue, uh, talking to folks, coming to things like this. Um, but also uh, to get back to what General Skinner uh, mentioned, you know, he mentioned the I call it the licensing discussion, but. Um, I know all of y'all have your own networks across the world, so I know there's a lot of innovation happening out at Cent, uh, CENTCOM right now and CENTAF for some of these capabilities like multi-level security capabilities are baking into AOC. Well, of course, we want that, right? So um, helping us understand maybe what we don't know that you're fielding globally would be really useful for the CAOR. Thank you. And, and I would say uh, we, it, it's time for real reform in cybersecurity. The, we're, we're, we're bound by this body of practice um, where we, it, it's all about compliance and compliance on the endpoint. And, and we do that at our peril. It's, it's slow. It takes us on the average of 18 months to get something through cybersecurity, even when it's like developed by the National Security Agency. Our, I challenge our NAO to say, what do you know about cybersecurity that the NSA does not? Or it's, or it's, it's, it's directed by General Skinner staff to improve network security. That to me is, where's my rubber stamp? It's approved. I think it costs money. It uh, takes every schedule we have out of control. It's an arbitrary checklist. And the most important thing is they look, they look at accreditation through the microscope of vulnerabilities on the endpoint. Working with partner agencies like DIS and NSA, we have built a very, very robust system of defense in depth. Um, we have I think probably state, you know, state of the art sensing. We have very smart people looking at the data. Uh, I think we should we should be able to characterize that and say, you know, if you have a new application and it will run on a STIG computer, fall within tech guidelines. If you know the provenance of that software, you didn't buy it from some Chinese guy at a, soup, at a shopping center in Singapore. No offense to, but uh, you know, and if it if you don't have to change the firewall settings, there's nothing that that thing can do. It may not work but it's not introducing any harm. We should be open to, to accept the security accreditation of our, of our brother and sister services here, you know? People know what, you know, they're not, they're not stupid. They, they don't put their networks at risk. 
that's, that's a big roadblock for me is, is convincing that. Um, I think that, I think we need a modern system. Our, our, our Navy CIO, Aaron Weiss, is really trying to do this. We need to look at, we need to look at risk. I, I work with a commander who manages operational risk every day. It's, it's a manageable problem if you look at that from, from what, what the damage is to the endpoint. We're, you know, we're spending, we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars doing this of direct cost and indirect cost, and it's time we, we, we reform. You know, it's like you need to know what's on your network to defend it. You know, I've, I've had the experience of having a, a foreign power take over a large enterprise network and got, gotten them out successfully. You need to know what's on the network. If you know what's on the network, you know how to maneuver it, you know how to remediate it, you know what you have to do, you know how to limit the damage. You know, but that should not be a roadblock. That should not take 14 to 18 months. Um, I'm a system engineer by education. You know, I, I, I ran field services for the Space and Naval Warfare Systems Command for 20 years. You know, we insisted that our ships be in baseline configuration. Most of the time, when I got flown someplace to fix a ship, either something had burned up or it was out of baseline. And we, we, have to, we have to enforce that. We have to know what's there so we can deal with it. And we should lower the barrier for that. And, and all those people who know are good, smart, hardworking people need to help us think about better ways to defend it. You know, we're, we're implementing the zero trust architecture. We have, you know, that's at the core of this um, arsenal mission package thing that General Brown alluded to. Um, we can go further. Uh, we've seen, you know, we've gotten, we've had an excellent proving ground over the last month or two about what, how our nation, how our networks can withstand nation state level attacks. General Skinner's helping us out immensely. Cloud-based internet isolation has really revolutionized how we protect our unclassified networks. But I think if we can lower, if we can realign our cybersecurity practices to truly focus on the real thing, which is engineering security solutions that are better, having people to look at the mountains of data that we collect every day and don't really go through to find those things that are deeply hidden. I think we'll all be better for it. We can, we can if, if um, the Marines have an application or the Air Force have an, has an application or the Army has an application that I want to use, I want to just take it and put it on my network. I, Thunder and I were talking before, I saw the Air Force has a tool for space situational awareness that I want. And if it's good, if the accreditation is good enough for them, it's and for Space Force, it's good enough for me. I think that's the big one. Wow. Uh, I'd propose that we um, we think about our training and our rehearsing um, the joint context and naval integration at at all levels. Right, right now within the Marine Corps, uh, our our. In the vast majority of our training is within of our training and our education, and particularly our evaluation is within service-specific lanes, um, requiring commanders of any aspect of a of a service force to demonstrate uh, a robust joint uh, for us for a naval integrated, but uh, a robust joint capability to show that you can really do joint C two is when you'll find communicators trained and are resourced to that skill set. Right now. Um, a joint context is is rare in a lot of our training, and it's there's always a trade-off. There's a trade-off between us maintaining our service competencies and exercising strongly within those. But a joint context is is rare, um, and it's frequently very thin. Uh, it may be it may be LNOs. It may be a much thinner context than when we truly expect a, a major joint uh, task force to operate at, and it's um, it's potentially ad hoc when we do it now because we want to focus on the. Uh, kind of tip of the spear, war fighting functions, and the command and control relationships get less attention. So emphasizing that more through all levels of training is an, is an avenue that, that I think we could grow into. So I, I would recommend um, actually focusing on interoperability. And so here at USAPAC, I think that uh, our, our path, our course of action, I think is going to be the, a, a very good way to move forward in terms of uh, taking a capability, we're offering an experimentation platform. You'll have users that are using it in the environment, the, an operational environment, so you'll get immediate feedback. And we'll have the opportunity to work through the challenges that Mr. Stevenson and others on the panel have discussed. You know, we're looking at the end-to-end -end challenges, whether those boundaries are artificial or physical. Uh, we know that there's a risk management framework perspective to consider. 
Um, there are many firewalls that affect a sensor to shooter um, execution that plagues our uh, theater fires element um, and team members. And so for us, the G5 Concepts is the organization and user pack where you get to introduce a capability um, and then you can get that particular concept um, kind of lined up and in a schedule and then we'll be able to provide it to users to give immediate feedback. So that would be my recommendation. Thank you. And we have a lot of questions lined up here from the audience. And so can we go to the first one? Okay. So with China and Russia's EMP capabilities, are we doing anything to harden our commercial communications infrastructure to fight through an EMP event? Okay, so I, I will take that. Um, it's classified. Um, but I, I will tell you what we are, you know, we work very closely with our commercial partners. So when you talk about partnering with industry, uh, we absolutely rely on uh, our commercial partners and we are working uh, with them as far as how do we uh, ensure security. Uh, most of our, you know, we encrypt our, our information, our networks, but we still have to be concerned about the, the EMP risk. Uh, and part of that is through building that resiliency we were, I was talking about earlier and increasing the uh, the redundancy as well as that uh, cybersecurity, but I would add on there, it's a, about hardening those, uh, the commercial infrastructure. Uh, I, I jumped on that grenade. Uh, Bob, did you want to add anything? <laughs> well, not really, because it is, it is class. The answer is yes, we are, and no, yeah. I can't tell you what. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Ma'am, I always offer one more thing. Um, it's, uh, if you think about the nature of this problem, there are other ways we can complicate the adversary's ca uh, calculus. For example, um, as the, the Kessel Run program is gonna build a series of global C2 nodes across the entire world that are all gonna be networked and data-centric. So if China and Russia wanna take it out, they gotta take out everything. So the idea is how do you complicate their, their, their calculus? Um, and, and so how do you uh, create uh, the ability to continue to survive and operate and in that kind of environment so you can't put all your eggs in one basket. So we're learning how to uh, we're testing out new concepts to be able to operate in a dispersed fashion to include this AOC. Um, and those are other unclassified ways, details aside, that uh, we can talk about in the uh, uh, unclassified form. Yeah. And I, I think that was an excellent point. And you know, Bob talked earlier about his uh, efforts with transport. And it's very much, it's not just about uh, hardening our commercial for EMP that this question infers to. It's about that resiliency re through redundancy, which means multiple transport paths and having capabilities that are able to leverage multi paths, right? So you know, for a topic later, I guess, during uh, the AIML, but you know, how do you automate that, uh, that failover of our, you know, our operational assets as well as our tactical assets over to the multiple paths? Thank you. The next question. Uh, cognitive warfare is different from information operations and psychological operations or information dominance. It is weaponizing, uh, excuse me, it is weaponizing artificial intelligence uh, and considered a global risk. What are, uh, what are we doing with our partners to address this new threat? Okay, the, I, you can read the question. I know there's a couple of, um, yeah, I'd like to start with there, that, yeah. with what we do in Information Environment Division. So we, uh, we do work with partners and, you know, broad, I, don't, I don't want to quibble about some of the definitions in here, but that cognitive space for decision advantage is you, we're focusing on our, our friend, the commander. Is that commander getting the right information at the right time? And so do we have uh, technology, processes, expertise that filter our sensing capability. Are we being deceived? Do we understand what's happening? Uh, are we making sense of the environment? So that's the, that's the sense and make sense portion of, of information operations. With our partners, that's, that's the sensors and the data systems that get information to their friendly commanders, but also educating uh, you know, through training and through education um, how a commander needs to make decisions. On the, on the other side of that, how do we attack that adversaries decision space, reduce their access to good information, fill them with information that leads them in the wrong direction, while most importantly, maintaining the credibility of the United States and allies and partners 
by using truth and transparency. We're being very effective with that in, uh, in a number of situations now, and we have subject matter expert exchanges and other means where we are trying to educate mar partners to, to use transparency, uh, valid information um, as, a, as a tool uh, to influence the environment they're working in. Any other? Yeah, I think that, you know, everything that Coach was just saying, you know, it all comes down to, you know, kind of the theme we were talking about is sharing information with our allies and partners. It's about being transparent. And so as these, um, these risk and this uh, um, cognitive warfare becomes apparent, what is critical is being able to be transparent and share that infor information with our allies and partners so they are cognizant of it. that goes into that. Uh, all right, next, next question. How are you leveraging AI uh, and ML in your cyber approach? And knowing that our adversaries have less red tape to contend with in their attack TTPs, what are your strategic plans to leverage and innovate around artificial intelligence to defend PACOM and slash maritime networks specific to MPE? Yeah, I'll take that one. So computers actually produce a lot of information when they're being attacked. The problem is it's so much information that no human being you know, can, can look at it with any scope and scale and, and figure, out, figure out what's exactly going on. So we've been working um, at central nodes to, to put in, uh, to use artificial intelligence to help go through all that and to be mindful of, and, and to put the parts together that indicates an attack. Um, we're, we've successfully employed a, something that was developed by the MITRE Corporation called their attack framework, where you, you look for the TTPs and you train the AIs how to find the TTPs, and then they highlight it to the humans. Uh, Captain Vince Chunky, is here. He's the CEO of our uh, communication station. He has uh, an organization called the, the Cybersecurity Operations Center, CSOC, it's, it's our most effective minute-by-minute -minute defenders. Uh, it, it's, they are assisted by AIs. At the end of the day, though, it takes smart people to validate what the AIs are telling me. AIs just let them go through the data faster. I think, I think that's the key where you have network defenders who are, who are living on the network with their algorithms and their, and their attack aids. They're looking for, looking for those kind of trends because the effective cyber attackers are very slow, very methodical, and, and they've learned how to obfuscate their origins. So it's by going after their, by going after their tactics, by having a, way, a means to contain them, that we're able to, I think, stay ahead of the problem. Um, I, I'll piggyback. Uh, I, I could speak for what the Air Force is trying to do, is trying to big, bring big data analytics to, to this particular problem set not just defend our networks, but defend our mission capabilities. So I know uh, they, they've developed a platform called Elixir for any of those who knew it, uh, know about it. So I think it's pumping all that data and then applying machine learning to it as, as well as the ability to query it. Um, and it was built uh, primarily to defend our, our core networks, but we're expanding it um, to incorporate other capabilities that we want to feed into it. For example, the mission defense teams I talked about before. Um, that has to be the approach if there's any chance of scoping and scaling this to, to fight this kind of adversary. By the way, this is a lot of how like industry does this, so, so you all are helping us, right? So if you go to any of these big cloud-based companies and stuff, they don't do the whack-a-mole kind of uh, version of, of cyber defense, which would be uh, kind of dumb. So um, I hesitate to say AI, because uh, that's a whole different ball of wax. Um, I, I'd be okay with saying uh, machine learning uh, applied to that, um, but that's kind of the state of the art right now. And if there's other ideas, we're very much open to them. Very much machine learning. All right, next question. With software and workforce empowerment as priorities, has leadership looked into ways of supporting the DOD software modernization strategy to assist in JADC2, Assured C2, and coalition interoperability? So I think one of the things we have to look at, and you know, General Skinner was teasing this out, is you know, really how do we look at software? Um, and, <clears throat> and it goes back to, uh, I think you had a question about this and we didn't get to it, is this as a service model. There is a lot we can, two things, there's a lot we can do with software that doesn't require us to 
completely uh, redo our networks. Um, and uh, to help us with that coalition interoperability. I spoke of that earlier with what we're doing with the Mission Data Platform. But I think there's also a lot of potential out there with as a service. Bob mentioned earlier how fast industry is moving and we need to catch up. I would say, you know, maybe we don't need to catch up, but we need to partner and look at how we can leverage industry uh, as, a, as a service. Uh, I used to have a boss, uh, I don't think he'll mind me attributing to him, attributing him to this. He used to tell me, you know, Denise, uh, and it's General, Lieutenant General Retired Crawford, he used to say, only do what you can do. And I know my team has heard me say this a lot, but there's only things that we in the DOD can do, and there's only things that industry can do. And that's where uh, we need your help, and I really think that as a service in the future is uh, where we best can use your help. So I'll say also um, in USERPAC, what we're actually implementing um, and actually evolving the installation as a docking station, which allows our uh, team members to continue to work on mission command systems uh, while at home stationed. So that will give us the ability to continue to work the system, provide feedback, uh, work with our allies and partners as we continue to try to evolve to provide uh, a COP, a persistent COP, and distributed mission command. So that's another practical way that we're uh, approaching that same problem set. I just bring up people in this question. Um, Marine Corps is putting a lot of interest, a lot of attention now towards talent management and maturing the force. We've reduced some occupational fields in favor of more technical skills. Uh, historically, the Marine Corps has been a very young force with I think more than 50% being less than 25 years of age or something. <clears throat> very physical, uh, very physical, very um, you know, highly deployed force in the past, but that may not be the model that works best for the environment that we're working in now. And so understanding and appreciating the investment we're going to need in training and in people to recruit and more importantly retain uh, the, the workforce that we have, and that was a part of that question, is, is that technology workforce is, is, uh, is really important to us. In, in talent management, we, we can't devote significant, specialized, technical training, invest into an individual who uh, we, we, we wish them well when they, when they exit the service, but we want to get the maximum uh, defense uh, utilization uh, out of that training and out of that as possible, all right, without, without necessarily holding them hostage to it. But we want to make an environment where they, they feel like this is the best place that they can, they can use those skills. And the Marine Corps is looking very hard at how we can do that in a lot of different ways. Thunder, any, any comments on that? Um, I'll just offer that uh, part one is uh, piggybacking, uh, partnering with industry. You all have talent that we should just figure out a better way to partner with each other. Um, instead of going to kind of our, our classic legacy uh, acquisition system, I think there's the as a service offers uh, models to do this. If y'all can go faster, funnier, and deal with more capability more rapidly than we can, instead of us trying to build up a force that, you know, to do things only the military can do, uh, there's, there's a huge opportunity there, and we can leverage the entire uh, power of our, our national assets and all of you to be able to do that. We need to bring that power to bear. Um, you know, for example, if we're trying to re-engineer the entire Air Force network to be software defined, you know, do I build a workforce inside and take 10 years to do that to figure out how that looks like? Uh, that's, you, you saw the math, that's six years too late. So uh, how about we come up with a way of partnering with industry to, to help us solve that problem and we can ask, hey, how would you do this? If we gave you a clock and said we want to transform the entire Air Force battle network from this to this, give you an as it's to be, and, and get the best ideas out there, you can probably help us solve some of those problems, probably because a lot of y'all operate at those scales already. So how do we bring that inside the house? Um, besides that, on the data centricity, I would say um, making data discoverable, making it to where folks can build custom apps so we can tap into it. So uh, whether you're a soldier, Marine, uh, sailor, uh, airman, guardian, um, any part of the joint force coalition, if you have access to these platforms and then you have a custom need that emerges, it shouldn't take five years to build an app to go figure that thing out. Case in point, the, uh, you know, the software that was built on the fly for the evacuation of Afghanistan, right? How fast was that? We need more of that. So there's ways you can do that, make folks, uh, I'll call it app savvy, um, partner with industry, and I think we can get it done. Yeah, I, I have to, to make an endorsement of the software, secure software development environment. That, that's the framework that we, can, that we can do that. We can build code rapidly that's well documented, that, we, that, 
that basically comes out of the foundry known secure. The accreditation, you know, by, by virtue of the fact it went through that process, it's good. It would get after that, that speed of capability. And if we can figure out a way to honor each other's DevOps environment, then we can take, we can take that killer app, app. As I said, cloud has a killer app. I want it. You know, I, I, will, I, will, I will get it. You know, we will get it. We have, we have to be able to do that. And we have to be able to, and I think that environment will allow us to recruit that force because Koichi talks about, about the people, you know. I think it's it's we have to we have to accept code because there are there are thousands of people in the industry that are doing that and they're doing it well and we need we need to be able to rapidly harness those talents. I, I'd li I would like to make a, a rec another recommendation. So when you're building s software and you're working different platforms, just focus on the simplicity of it as well. And so if it requires a lot of signal or um, intervention, if you need a you know, a signalier to go in and fix it, then that's probably not our best option, right? We need to be able to utilize a, a platform that our commanders or our, our a tactical user can utilize seamlessly and it's intuitive. So just think about that as well as we work through that. Can I offer, offer one more thing? Uh, I'd be remiss in saying that um, one of the things I think we're all working on is also how do we retool our own workforce to be uh, more savvy in all these capabilities, like uh, to be a data-centric smart force, to be an app smart force. You know, old guys like me, you know, I gotta, I gotta constantly relearn. But we have professional civilians who are very combat capable. We got, uh, you know, professional officers. We got a professional enlisted force. We have contract mission partners. Um, I think there's a retooling of our force uh, from a talent management standpoint that I think there's still more work to do. I can at least speak for the Air Force. There's more work to do on that side of the house. We can do better. Yeah. In and including I, ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think there's the, the you know, talent management and training our force for a data-centric environment. But I think uh, it's not about being, it, they don't have to be the data engineers. They don't have to be the data scientists. Uh, that's where we look at, you know, partnering with industry. But kind of what Bob was hitting at, I think, is, you know, how do we, you know, train, get trained as a, uh, a service or a joint force to be able to leverage, you know, these new capabilities, the data-centric environment. Um, and I'm sure we'll hit on the uh, security, but, you know, one of the things that we didn't hit on with data centricity, I mean, the, the theme of the conference is from data to dominance, is the it, added security that a data-centric approach provides. It provides us defense in depth. Uh, you know, we've all, we, all the information that we've been protecting has been protected through the network security, and now we have that extra layer of defense with, the, uh, with being able to protect that data and only ensuring that those who, have, um, who need access have access at the right place, right time. So, and that's you know, one of those things that we have to continue to evolve and understand all the advantages of uh, software, uh, and as far as uh, data centricity. And uh, so I appreciate these uh, answers because, uh, and, and, and as we talked previously, it's not just about the technology, right? You have to empower the workforce, training, education, and you have to have the processes and procedures and the concept of operations to employ all this stuff. And sometimes those are the harder challenge mm -hmm. than just bringing new technology in. Uh, we have five minutes left. Uh, I want to do a quick fire. Quick fire close out here. Uh, we'll start with Lisa, but just, just uh, you know, 30 seconds each. Um, any any final thoughts uh, for the audience here? No, I, I think that we definitely need the partnership, not only uh, from the joint perspective, but certainly with industry. And so we really just look forward to uh, implementing some of the new capabilities that you're working on. And uh, thank you for your time. I think everyone that operates, trains, or designs a product for a warfighter uh, can get very focused in the narrow aspects of what it does, but we have to understand that everything we do now is gonna connect someplace else, and it's on us to explore where those connections go, and how is my data, how is my process, how is it gonna be received elsewhere? And it's, you know, it's not just, is this message format work, but does my policy, does my procedure work everywhere, and exploring, um, all other aspects of friction that keep us from moving uh, at the speed of modern battle. I think this, this thing about ed education and, and building up our workforce is critical. Uh, I was very lucky. I inherited an enormously talented team 
And I've watched them evolve as we go through this stuff, if we transform um, from uh, you know, basically server concentric to data center or now into cloud. Uh, I think there's a, there's a vast pool of talent uh, in the United States. I've, I've been to Amazon, I've been to SpaceX, I've been to some of these other things. It's, a, it's uplifting to see what Americans are capable of doing. I think we have an enormous untapped talent pool on this island. Our schools are great. The people here are smart. Um, our workforce is aging. We need, to, we need to figure out what it takes to attract and retain these young people to serve them and to support the ones that are serving in uniform. If you've not been, if you've not seen operating forces, if it's Army or Air Force or been aboard a, an aircraft carrier and watched that, I commend it to, to, to you to see what young Americans are capable of. We owe them our best. Um, I'll just uh, first say uh, thanks for your attention, uh, too. Uh, I would offer that um, if you have thoughts and ideas on anything we talked about today um, and uh, are open to, we're, that PACAF is open to take risk in regards to trying to create the future we need to go build on a clock. Uh, we've got a crack team that's willing to take some risks. Uh, we've got the Air Force helping us out. We've got the Joint Force helping us out. So um, looking forward to uh, more discussions. I'm um, hoping this is just the beginning. Okay, so first of all, thank you, FCA and uh, industry, and everybody, uh, one, FCA for inviting us to do this panel, and uh, of course, industry and our other our allies and partners. We do have a partner in the audience with us, uh, so I appreciate you attending. I hope you're, you're getting a lot out of this. Um, but thanks for hosting us, uh, and I would ask that you know, our industry partners, I talked about only doing what we can do, help us, you know, partner with us to be able to do only what we can do. Uh, Bob and Thunder uh, briefly mentioned this about uh, the education and the talent we need on island. Uh, this whole team has been partnering with the University of Hawaii uh, as well as the, uh, the state senate, uh, several of the state senators, but really about how do we build talent on this island, how do we retain talent without having to uh, contract out and bring teams over here uh, on and off. Uh, and so we are, we're working with the University of Hawaii. I will put a shameless plug out there. If industry is interested, there is a job fair being hosted by the University of Hawaii on the 29th of April. The uh, last day to register is the 14th of April. But I do foot stomp this because we really need the talent here on island. It is very, it's, it's a long process to be able to hire uh, folks into uh, our organization. So. With that, I uh, appreciate everything, and thank you, Paul, for hosting it. Uh, you welcomed me to Island about you know, two and a half years ago, and it's great to see you again. That's awesome, awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, I just want to take a quick opportunity. What you all are doing, um, MAGIC, all right, the acronym, not the, uh, not the, not the you know, uh, is critically important. It is a complex uh, team sport that you were all embarked on, and I'm glad that we have this team out here right now at this point in time working together uh, to enable these capabilities for the Indo-Pacific. Thank you for what you do, and thank you for uh, participating in this panel today. And I, too, uh, would like to thank our panel members today. Uh, one of the things that we find is the ability for us to come together and have some of these discussions are invaluable. For the last two and a half years, as you all know, we've gone through a pandemic, and Hawaii has been the last state probably in the country to come out of the pandemic. And I have a big shout out to General Brown, because last summer we had some dialogue about November TechNet. And we knew we weren't going to be there, even though some of the other states in the mainland were having their conferences. We made a decision with her guidance as well, not to do another virtual, but to have an in-person. Just to tell you today, I was just talking to Mike Warlick sitting there looking at the numbers. We are just about where we were 2019. So that's thanks to everybody here in person, not doing a virtual, have the hallway discussions, not just the panels and the um, keynotes, but the hallway discussions, the social discussions, all the dialogue that happens with everybody here to be able to join. So again, thank you very much to the panel for taking your time. And again, General Brown, thank you very much because this is a team effort, as you say, and there's a team effort between FCA Hawaii, FCA International, and with the J6 at Indo-PACOM. So again, mahalo for that. Also, on behalf of FCA Hawaii and FCA International, 
I would like to let you know that we are making a donation in your behalf to the friends of the Windward Wounded Warriors. So um, thank you again. We have a traditional um, challenge coin uh, highlighting this is the 36 TechNet. So again, I have that for each of you. And just as a quick reminder, this is again the 2021 TechNet. <laughs> November 20, <laughs> postponed. We will have another TechNet in Hawaii in November 2022, six months from now. We expect to see all of you here and more. But again, thank you for coming, and thank you to our panel members. And thank you, General Fredenberg. <laughs> <laughs>